Today's speaker is Philip Deloria, the uh, Arcatrine Laman resident scholar. Phil hails from an extremely distinguished Lakota family of intellectuals and an artist or two, if I'm not mistaken. Um, he received his bachelor's degree from the University of Colorado Boulder, his PhD in American Studies from Yale University. He served on the faculty of UC Boulder, the University of Michigan, and now holds the Leverett Salton Skull Chair in the History Department at Harvard. I've never met anybody named Leverett, Leverett Salton Skull, but only at Harvard. <laughs> it's a very distinguished chair, or a very distinguished scholar. His award-winning books include Playing Indian, 1999, and Indians in Unexpected Places, 2004. He serves as a trustee of the National Museum of the American Indian and is past president of the American Studies Association and recently completed a term as president of the Organization of American Historians. His awards and recognitions are too numerous to name, but I think you get the idea. <laughs> and some we're delighted to have him at SAR, and I hope you'll join me in welcoming Phil Dillon. Well, I will say only at Harvard, right? Uh, there's an old uh, New England family, the Leverett family, and there's an old New England family, the Saltstall family, and the two of them go together. Um, Leverett Saltstall was uh, actually quite an interesting uh, senator back in the 50s and 60s, really integral to uh, preservation of the Cape Cod seashore, um, big supporter of the national parks, and really kind of nicely for me, a big supporter of the Smithsonian. So my term as a trustee at the Museum of the American Indian, it seems like it's, I was worried, you know, they give you the name of this chair and you think like, oh, who is this guy? But he ends up being okay. So, um, so I want to first of all just say how grateful I am to be here um, in Santa Fe um, uh, on the ancestral territory of Ogepoge Owinge. Um, as we all know, this entire continent is all indigenous land and indigenous territory. And I think whenever we gather, we need to sort of stop, pause, reflect on that, reflect where we sit in relation to this particular place. I'm also really grateful to um, SAR, to Michael, to the staff, who's really kind of pulled it all together for all of us as fellows and visitors. It's really a fantastic and amazing place, and I just could not be more grateful right, to be in your company, uh, the company of the folks who are here. Um, and with that, let me get going. So on the night of November 12th, 1833, uh, in bison hide teepees and Mandan earth lodges, crowded slave quarters and adobe apartments, urban brownstones and wooden longhouses, New England salt boxes and frontier cabins, the people of North America drifted off to sleep. In the hours before dawn, they would be awakened by the shouts of their friends and neighbors. The sky, as one observer described it, was on fire. For perhaps four hours, the Leonid meteor storm of 1833 sent thousands of meteors hurtling from the sky. The falling stars, watchers said, were as thick as snowflakes in a winter storm. Fireballs hung in the air, pulsing with the candle power of a massive lightning bolt. Bolides, large meteors that produced the sounds of a sonic boom, added to the power of this meteor storm. Well, the event ended with the light of dawn, although meteors continued to fall, though they were now invisible, uh, and a disparate collection of continental peoples began to make knowledges, to contemplate through the lens of an unthinkable phenomenon, the epistemological questions of how it is we know what we think we know. Here's a kind of basic definition of epistemology. I know one of our colleagues here is a philosopher, and I'm hoping that at some point he'll school me on this a little better than I'm schooled. Um, so the, these people began to ponder and question, to speculate and explain, to testify and to preach, and to turn their fear and their wonder into memory and history. Now there's a lot of ways to think about epistemology and I'm only just beginning to sort of do that, but just a couple of ways or kind of categories up in the upper left you can see sort of a standard way of thinking about some ways which we think we know we, what we know. On the upper right, my colleague Jill Lepore has been thinking a lot about the nature of evidence. There was a kind of fantastic New Yorker piece, as there always is from Jill every couple of weeks, um, in which she sort of thought through these kind of different forms of evidence and the ways that we might make sense of them. The kind of lower right we can see uh, 
uh, kind of set of different Christianities that were sort of unfolding um, since this is uh, you know, sort of shifts um, in this moment from kind of mainline Protestantism to various forms of evangelicalism to this possibility of actual revelation coming out in the Christian tradition through the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, for example, which claims this. And then on the lower left, we can see certain kinds of changes in the scientific paradigms that people were thinking about. All of this is some part of this package about how people were actually trying to make knowledge. Having said all that, let's go and start with a story on the upper Missouri River, the German explorer naturalist Prince Maximilian of Vide Neuvide was part of a kind of epistemological encounter. His journal entry for November 13th reads, in the morning, bright sky, raw, strong wind from the west. At nine o'clock, a mandan with a very concerned face came and told us there had been an extraordinary sign in the sky. Shooting stars had soared toward the west last night in great numbers, by far more than usual. This meant war or high mortality among humans. He asked what Mr. Kipp thought about it. Later, other Indians came, Dipach, Sichida, and another handsome man with noble features, Adapusa. All of them spoke about the meteor shower so inexplicable to them. After 10 o'clock, the weather was bad. And this is how these journals usually work. So it's a short passage, but a rich one. Here's some of the possible interpretive work that one might do. Not long after the meteors had vanished with the dawn, a man-dan man, unidentified, comes into the Fort Clark Post to do what? To report the news? To receive an explanation? To convey a warning? Maximilian understands that the meteors carry meaning for the Mandan. They are not simply an event, but also a sign, a text to be read, a thing demanding interpretation. Well, one common interpretation for meteors and comets for many people in many places is frightful. The meteors are a portent, a sign with predictive power. The falling stars demand of the present a consciousness of the future, one that carries a value and a direction. In other words, something bad is on its way, war or death or both. Now, for those of you who are interested in the sort of German theoretical tradition, I'm gonna make a kind of Walter Benjaminian move. For those of you who don't care about this, ignore that. So, we might say that this knowledge was uh, acquired through mimetic correspondence. The advent of meteors corresponds in mysterious ways to other events in the world. Signs speak to one another, and they speak to material reality, and they do so through a complicated sense of time that is both transcendent, that is to say present and future and perhaps past, are intertwined in coincidence, but also linear. The present, in other words, is distinct from the future and one may in fact lead to the other, right? And so there's a complicated sense of temporality that we try to perhaps wrap our heads around. But the Mandan effort does not stop there, for this unpleasant prediction is perhaps just tentative. Indeed, the Mandan man, it seems, is not actually making a definitive claim, but a speculative one, as much a question as a prophecy. For the meteors are not only a sign, they are also an event to be investigated, something around which knowledge might be newly made. And the Mandan man suspects that the trader, Mr. Kip, may have a different interpretation from his own and is curious about what he might make of the stars. So what the Mandan man seeks is a conversation. And James Kipp, who was a corresponding member of the Academy of Science in St. Louis, might well have been an excellent discussant. Now the second part of the passage confirms this sense of a desire for investigation. For now, an entire Mandan delegation arrives to exchange interpretations. That group included some of Maximilian's most frequent interlocutors, the elder Dipach and the young warrior Sichita, both of whom would spend significant time over the following months conversing with the man of science, Maximilian, to whom we might now turn. Maximilian traveled uh, North America between 1832 and 1834, publishing his observations in 1839, and kind of stretched the publication a little bit beyond that. Now, he frames the, the possibility of an exchange differently than the Mandans do. 
through the blurry lenses of what we might call a kind of imperialist scientism. The Mandan wanted to talk about the event, Maximilian hints, not because they could read the sign in the sky, but because they could not. It was inexplicable beyond their ability to explain. And in making that observation, uh, Maximilian subtly frames the Mandan as something of the lesser people, beings outside of Western scientific knowledge. They come not for a mutual exchange, in his view, but for a kind of imperial enlightenment. There's the hint that his own speculations, whatever they may be, will inevitably be more rigorous, less superstitious, superior. Far away in New Haven, Connecticut, the Yale astronomer Denison Olmsted made a similar distinction. It's one that kind of permeates the reactions to these meteors. The celestial phenomenon, he said, was viewed with admiration and delight by one class of spectators and with astonishment and fear by another class. That admiring class of philosophers, as another observer called them, laid claim to rationalist ways of making knowledge in and about the world. They were inheritors of an epistemological practice descended from Aristotle, Descartes, Copernicus, Galileo, and Newton, progenitors of an idea today we lump together as something like scientific method. Gather, observe, and interpret evidence, make deductive claims that lead to potential hypotheses, test hypotheses, even seeking to falsify them, analyze results, and generalize them as the abstraction we sometimes call theory. Now, if some Mandans read the stars as a sign to be interpreted, others saw it very much as an event to be investigated and perhaps explained. Enmeshed in this situation of cross-cultural exchange, Sichita and Deepach imagine that all of them, traders, Indians, naturalists, artists, might pool their knowledge and figure out this inexplicable thing together. Olmsted and Maximilian, on the other hand, saw a world or seemed to see a world in which Indian people, among others, could not by definition have an observational science on par with that of scientific elites. We know from sort of thinking about what uh, Native North America looks like that this is actually just not true. Um, I would point you to the fabulous earthworks of Ohio, which have just recently been named to UNESCO status and represent lots and lots of hard work over long periods of time to understand the astronomy and the landscape of their particular place. But what's interesting to me is that at least four and perhaps more epistemological positions seem to be happening at Fort Clark. Mysterious sign, Mandan investigation, rationalist science, and colonialist Eurocentric assumption, all of these things coming into contact at the same time. So with those distinctions in mind, let me offer just a bit of counterfactual fabulation, an imaginative, my own imaginative journal entry um, by Maximilian that might look something like this. Mandan delegation returned, wanting to talk more about last night's stars. Mr. Kipp shrugged his shoulders and said he could not explain it. A missionary sheltering at the fort loudly insisted that God's wrath had been unfurled and the end times were nigh. The Negro servant of a Missouri trader laughed at that and impudently said that the stars were a sign of the end times all right, but for the unjust practice of slavery. And it must be admitted that Mr. Bodmer, who might have painted the event in all its glory, and myself, a curious and informed man of science, both slept soundly through the storm of meteors and did not see it at all. So Maximilian's journal, so rich with detail on all manner of natural science, he's a fabulous person to read and very sympathetic, actually, to native people. But the journal does not again mention what was arguably the most impressive astronomical event of his entire lifetime. He did not see it, as far as I can tell, and could have nothing to say about it to the Mandans or anyone else. It's just a lesson in humility, right, that I think ought to be attached to any sort of scientific claims. Well, today we understand that the Leonid meteors stem from the Earth's passage through the tail of the Temple Tuttle Comet, which offers Earthlings a few meteors each November and a shower or storm every 33 years. We also understand that the 1833 meteor shower was world historical in its power, comparable only to storms in 1966, 1566, 1238, and 934. I've kind of circled these on this really interesting kind of chart. 
These are moments when the orbits of Earth and the comet drew abnormally close. It's also the case that the comet leaves behind these dust fields, and so we can actually pass through dust and meteors, debris that has been left in the 18th century, right? And so the combination of these things, it's all quite interesting and quite complicated, and I don't fully understand it, but I'm trying. Um, so our contemporary knowledge of meteors, um, indeed the modern field of meteor science, can in fact be traced directly to the storm of 1833. But at that time, no one, not Mandans, not Western men of science, not religious thinkers, no one was able to offer a satisfactory explanation. On the upper Missouri and elsewhere, however, Contemplation of the falling stars seemed to break along two broad categorical lines, as I've mentioned. The event, a physical world of observation and description, curiosity, puzzling and investigation, and the sign, a metaphysical world of prophecy, important, of worlds coming to an end, of heavenly deliverance. But, as the Mandan delegation's encounter with Maximilian suggests, these ways of making knowledge are not necessarily exclusive. The categories, we might associate them perhaps with a pair of Western names like science and religion, the categories have subsets and variations, overlaps and different figurations, a range of possibilities that I think exceed those categories. And how could they not? Imagine, close your eyes, imagine looking up and seeing somewhere between 20 and 40 meteors each second. And they go quick, yes, but many of them linger in the sky for longer than just that kind of deal, which amplifies the experience. Some produce jet trails that hang in the air. Fireballs generate um, these lights that illuminate the world for several seconds. That's just one second's worth. The next second, 20 to 40 more, and the next second, 20 to 40 more, and after that, and after that, and after that, right? So wrap your head around what that was like. For all kinds of observers, this meteor storm created, I think, a kind of um, contradictory consciousness or consequence, and not simply around what I framed as the metaphysical sign and the physical event. On the one hand, the falling stars suggested, I think, in some cases, what we might think of as a kind of epistemic break an event so far outside the range of human experience that it threw knowledge systems themselves into disarray and disorder. On the other hand, when nothing dire actually seemed to take place the next day, witnesses from across the continent doubled down on um, what they thought they knew with surprising ease. They confirmed and they intensified it. So if those folks hesitated in the moment, well, the next morning found them essentially unchanged. How do we kind of reconcile these sort of possibilities which we can see in the historical record? Well, these people of 1833 were a curious lot, and um, it is a fallacy um, to link their world too closely to our own. And yet, this is what historians do, right? We write out of the present into the past, and we try to think about how we make sense of it. So here's a couple of things to ponder in the category of, hello, 2023 calling. First, in our present moment, as the line between fact and fiction, real and artificial, becomes ever more uncertain, our ways of imagining our past, present, and future have become increasingly dependent on questions of epistemology, how we think we know what we think we know, and how we think about all of that thinking. Are we actually in the middle of an epistemic break? or just an intensification of familiar patterns, American patterns of paranoia, doubt, skepticism, and conspiracism. Second, Americans have on this continent imagined the United States into being as a nation state, fixing and patrolling its physical and psychic borders, and trying hard to figure out what to do with its multiplicity, and how to confront the painful histories that produce that multiplicity as something too often uneven, unjust. How do we make sense of this place as a multiracial, multicultural, multinational political entity? It seems to me that these two things, epistemology and American multiplicity, collide and actually threaten to destroy one another. We can't trust what we know, we can't trust what others think they know, leaving us a kind of pathetic collection of fragmented know-nothings, mutually hostile and blessed with an unpromising future. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it is hello 2023, right? So in what follows, I want to begin to trace out what might be a different story, and I 
don't know quite what that looks like. Uh, but the outlines of a multi-epistemological inquiry that considers both social and epistemic difference and human commensurability viewed across the continent over a span of a very few hours. So the Mandan and the Lakota, Blackfeet, Kiowa, and other Plains tribes enshrined this year, the year the stars fell, on winter counts, these hide and then later cloth and paper canvases on which they marked the memorable events of each year so that those moments could be recalled and repopulated with stories and memories. Winter counts could be quite idiosyncratic, recording the local particularities of specific groups, but everyone keeping a winter count and across the plains marked down the year of the falling stars, 1833. But so did other native folks as well, Cherokees, dealing with uh, Indian removal, right? Um, in the Cherokee Phoenix, uh, devised a sarcastic prayer of the Georgians in which they sort of forced the Georgians to actually kind of repent in relation to the falling stars. Uh, Akimel Odom um, calendar stick, which actually begins in 1833 with the year of the falling stars. And Pawnee people who constantly saw themselves as a social group, completely and intimately linked to the stars, right? Um, they also sort of told these stories about this particular kind of event. So it happens all across Indian country, all across North America. These winter counts suggest, and calendar sticks and other things, suggest distinctively, uh, or distinctive ways of thinking about time and about natural phenomena. While some have argued that many native societies de-emphasize temporality and historicity, favoring spatiality and locality instead, my father among them, the relationship seems to me to be somewhat more complicated. This idiosyncratic but memorable strategy of the winter count emphasized the social meanings attached to the past, creating a historical consciousness, but one of a different kind. The strategy of the West, numbered years in linear arrangement, is powerful to be sure, producing a very useful sense of history and historicity. In that way of measuring time, what matters is not so much what happened at any one time, but that years follow one from another inexorably, um, and that this flow of time produces cause and effect relations of change, and thus the narratives that we call history. Winter counts measure temporality, but not through storylines that track change over linear time, although it is the case that in some winter counts, right, people are in fact bouncing back and forth right across time. The social temporality is that of the chronicle. This is something that historians often differentiate. Right? The chronicle is a kind of list of specifically selected, recounted events um, that leaves open the question of exactly what one might do with these kinds of events. Do you look for patterns? Do you seek out a relationship or cause and effect? Do you trace change over time? These are kind of classic Western ways of seeing history. That's not exactly what the winter counts do. They use it to mark time in many, many distinctive and different sorts of ways. So the Leonids, stunning as they were, did not change the nature of this native timekeeping, at least as far as I can tell. Native people, not just on the plains, but everywhere, knew the skies well, and on the one hand, understood the meteor storm to be clearly exceptional. On the other, a people who watched the sky fastidiously had seen astronomical phenomena like meteor showers, and the definition here, shower, is uh, less than 1,000 meteors per hour, whereas the meteor storm is more than 1,000 per hour. Um, they'd seen these things many times before, the Leonids, perhaps on other occasions, like 1799, a big storm, um, the Perseids, the Taurids, and others. They recorded and remembered comets and other celestial phenomena. Many winter counts from the year 1821-22, for instance, converge in fixing on a large fireball that moved across the sky from southeast to northwest, bellowing like a buffalo, as one described it. Now that description, bellowing like a buffalo, oftentimes opens up to Western readers a sort of sense that like, well, this is folklore, this is imagination, this is mythic stories, these kinds of things, right? This is perhaps the ways that Maximilian or Denison Olmsted might have interpreted that particular claim. But as Von Del Chamberlain, who's done a lot of this really interesting work, observes, the acoustic phenomena accompanying fireballs are often complex. 
Usually, there are several sonic booms followed by clattering or rumbling, which might go on for some tens of seconds. The booms are produced by large fragments and other sounds by smaller fragments, all moving beyond the speed of sound. The entire acoustic event may last the better part of a minute. So this 1821 fireball, observed by native people and recorded by them, was perhaps something less than the 1833 meteor storm, but it was one among many significant astronomical events that became social markers around which intimate and local memories might be recalled. So while fear may have been one way of understanding Great Plains native responses, a better word might be awe, and I use the word in the same sense as religious studies scholars who suggest a kind of reverential encounter with the sacred, that holy thing that cannot be fully explained, but which must be investigated. And that, I think, would be a Northern Plains approach, must be investigated. So simultaneously, mysterious omen and observational challenge, native epistemologies ignored, collapsed, and transcended those Western categories of science and religion. And whatever the meteors were and meant, they did not mark an epistemic break. As the keeper of the Mandan butterfly winter count would later recall, yes, I have heard of that story. All the stars in the sky fell to the ground. The crow people in the mountains saw them, and our people saw them fall also. It happened at night. But no one knows just what the stars were or if they really struck the ground. I do not know whether the Indians were frightened by the falling stars or not. Well, the experience of the falling stars must have created an intense shock to the system. Today, we understand meteors and we assure ourselves that a meteor storm is nothing to fear, even as we imagine planet destroying asteroids and launch missions to sort of take them out, um, or at least plan those missions. But remove this knowledge that we have and imagine yourself back in 1833. Recall those 20 to 40 meteors per second. It's not hard to understand that awful fear was the reasonable reaction among many people in different places. Abraham Lincoln saw the Leonids, for example, and he painted a picture of what must have unfolded in towns across the country. One night I was roused from my sleep by a rap at the door, he said, and I heard the deacon's voice exclaiming, he was lodging with a deacon at the time, arise Abraham, the day of judgment has come. How biblical is that? <laughs> So the meteor storm arrived near the tail end of the Second Great Awakening, the religious revival movement that reoriented Protestantism towards evangelicalism and helped generate new American religious traditions, including the Adventists and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The camp meeting and the mass revival were its forms, and it was driven by a millennialism that made the end of the world a key element in the ways its believers constructed and received knowledge. So if the end times were coming, awakening demanded a human effort towards perfectibility. You wanted to get as good as you could, right, before Christ emerged and sort of brought the end times on. And so individual free will and accompanying social reform became baked into its culture. In 1831, for instance, William Miller advanced a complicated set of calculations based on readings of biblical prophecy that seemed to suggest the second coming of Christ was imminent. He targeted 1843 and then later 1844, such that the years between would be full of signs of the times. This was the title of the newspaper that the Millerites, there was a whole bunch of them, launched in 1840 to advance their cause. Nor was William Miller alone. The messianic missionary Joseph Wolfe set 1847 as the moment of Christ's premillennial advent. He, in turn, deeply influenced Harriet Livermore, a celebrated woman preacher who sermonized about the end times to Congress, President Madison, who dismissed her, um, and the cabinet in 1832, 38, and 43. And she actually preached to Congress one more time after that as well. True believers in the end of the world were liberated in a way to experiment, create, emote, and prophesy. And they crafted a distinct epistemology that fused religious millennialism with oftentimes radical social experiment. Central and Western New York, the so-called burned over district, kicked up spiritualism, Mormonism, utopian colonies, social radicalism, abolitionism, women's rights, vegetarianism, and prohibition. It was a profoundly weird place living through a profoundly weird moment. 
You might experiment with free love. Imagine that in the 19th century. Or imagine conspiracy theories about those Freemasons over in their lodge trying to secretly dominate the world. Hello, 2023. Or hunt for buried treasure at night and find sacred, uh, sacred tablets and white salamanders. Millennialists pointed to natural signs as evidence for their claims. The Great Comet of 1811, the New Madrid Earthquake of 1811 and early 1812, and unsurprisingly, the Leonid meteor storms of 1833. One anonymous commentator warned those speculating on various natural causes for such things to think again, to acknowledge that God's hand was in it, and it was all done by his special direction. Quoting prophecy, and I will show the wonders in the heavens above and the signs in the earth belief, blood and fire and etc. The writer demanded, are we not ready to say that it must mean something to take place at or near the end of the world? Those who took interpretive meaning from the Bible pointed frequently to the book of Mark, and the stars of heaven shall fall, and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Writing from Ohio, Benjamin Lakin observed that some thought the day of judgment was come and the stars falling and called their family together for prayer. Others made it a subject of sport and merriment. And so it will be when the general judgment comes. Some will be praying and some laughing. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints founder Joseph Smith noted in his diary that the stars were indeed a sign of the impending second coming of Christ and perhaps a punishment on those who would oppress the church. In Missouri, Redrick Allred, a recently baptized member, was trying to survive the anti-Mormon hostility that has seized the area of Jackson County. The night the saints were expelled from their homes, he recalled, the Western world was shocked by the stars falling from the heaven that lit up the whole atmosphere. But Rhetoric Allred's dating on this is not quite right. The Mormons had already been expelled from their homes when the stars fell. So there's a kind of a retroactive memory here. It won't be the first time that we see this. In Independence, Missouri, according to Josiah Gregg, uh, the locals who had recently driven the Mormons from Jackson County saw the falling stars and they had, themselves had second thoughts, worried that perhaps they had incurred the wrath of God with their mob rule ethnic cleansing in which they demonized Mormons in relation to both Indian people as potential converts and to the enslaved. So there's an interesting discourse that's going on here about all the traumas of American society at this moment. It's not surprising that millennialists engaged in this bit of self-serving memory politicking. Philo Dibble, an LDS convert in Kirtland, Ohio, quickly crafted a powerful retroactive account in which he had Joseph Smith predict for a non-believer that the stars would fall from the sky within a 40-day time period. Unsurprisingly, the Leonids arrived on the 39th night. The unbeliever was shaken, if not necessarily redeemed. Dibble reversed the flow of time in a way to insert a supposed prophecy back into a spiritually determined historical record. And the effort mixes both cynicism and true believership. The meteors put less cynical, more devoted revivalists to an epistemological test. Could they fully entrust their production of knowledge to faith alone, to a holy book, to a prophet? Were they really ready for the second coming? Look out in the streets as the stars fell from the sky. You might see people carrying burdens on their consciences. Josiah Henson, the supposed inspiration for Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom, saw some of those folks as he encountered the Leonids on an underground railroad mission to liberate enslaved people in Kentucky. I reached Lancaster, Ohio at three o'clock in the morning, found the village aroused, the bells ringing, the people exclaiming, the day of judgment is come. And I love this. I thought it was probably so, but felt I was in the right business <laughs> and walked on through the village, leaving the terrified people behind. The stars continued to fall until the light of the sun appeared. Henson, a preacher in his own right, walked straight through a millennialist crisis of faith, knowledge, and conscience as he proceeded through the town, focused on a material experience he knew to be true and pressing that of enslavement and freedom. Many observers mentioned the ways in which the stars marked a communal and collective awareness among those who had been enslaved, one that often pointed to the immediacies of struggle and the possibilities of divine intervention in the tradition of the biblical Moses, right? A particular form of slave Christianity that's taking shape here. In one WPA slave narrative, for instance, 
Abraham recounted, so many grown people crowded into the house, it weren't no use for me to try to get in. Many people crowded together under the foot high sill underneath the house. Jane Clark, only 11 years old and forced to rise at four o'clock in the morning to fetch water. She had to make five trips a day to this spring to bring water for the house. Saw the stars fall. The scene, uh, reported a later recorder, is vivid in her memory. The children were on their way to the spring. They were not old enough to be alarmed by the unusual sight, but ran along trying to catch the stars as they fell. On November 13th and 14th and 15th and after, southern slaveholders began telling themselves stories that traded in the distinctions so firmly drawn by Dennis and Olmsted. Unenlightened people of bondage in superstitious terror, a planter elite responding with confidence and intrigued appreciations. Slaveholders insisted that the enslaved had run in fear to find their enslavers begging them for protection against the end of the world. Like Philo Dibble, those slave owners recovered quickly from the shock of the falling stars and immediately crafted narratives that fit the world as they knew it, a place of unquestioned white supremacy. I'm not saying that enslaved people were not afraid. Um, there's ample testimony that they were, in fact. But these kind of narratives about who has rationality and who has confidence and who is afraid, I think, you know, are, are found quite frequently here. But those claims prove hard to sustain, particularly when contested by accounts from those who had been enslaved. Harriet Power's magnificent pictorial quilt, crafted between 1895 and 1898, takes up the falling stars, centering God, the enslaved, and if you look closely, over here, a mouse. White slave owners are not to be found in her description. The falling stars of November 13th, the people were frightened and thought that the end had come. God's hand stayed the stars. The varmints rushed out of their beds. And for those who are interested in sort of contemporary versions of this, Robert Pruitt has this sort of beautiful thing, um, you know, where he sort of takes and remakes sort of icons of African American culture. Um, so here you can see he's playing with Harriet Jacobs, uh, Harriet Jacobs quilt. In Georgia, as reported and then reprinted in William Lloyd Garrison's Liberator, a slave owner ran out in nothing but a shirt and took fearful refuge under the house which was raised up on blocks. One of the Negroes, as much frightened as his master, sought the same refuge, but finding his master there, suddenly explained, this place won't do for me, it's not safe here, the master is too wicked. And he got out and ran off. An oral history passed down from the formerly enslaved Amanda Young observes that in fact everyone was scared. The white folks started calling all the slaves together and for no reason they started telling some of the slaves who their mothers and fathers was and who they'd been sold to and where. The old folks were so glad to hear where their people went. They made sure we all knew what happened. You see, they thought it was judgment day. Harriet Tubman's biographer suggests that Tubman interpreted the stars as a sign of judgment coming to the unjust, and Frederick Douglass seems to have had uh, thought in similar terms. I witnessed this gorgeous spectacle and was awestruck. The air seemed filled with bright descending messengers from the sky. It was about daybreak when I saw this sublime scene. I was not without the suggestion at the moment that it might be the harbinger of the coming of the Son of Man. And in my then state of mind, I was prepared to hail him as my friend and deliverer. I had read that the star shall fall from heaven, and they were now falling. So if evangelicals welcomed the second coming, and enslaved people saw deliverance, white Southerners betrayed the ways that slavery structured their own thinking even as the thought of judgment complicated their understanding of themselves. It made, I think, for a curious epistemological stew. Defiant insistence upon white racial superiority, fear of judgment for the national sin and for their own, and despite their acknowledgement of their own personal culpability, still the possibilities of an earthly and perhaps heavenly redemption for themselves, even for the slave driver. Right? How does one reconcile all the complications that must have been going on in their heads? When the study of meteors that would make his professional name and career, Yale professor Dennison Olmsted began with a summation of the wonders of the meteor storm, giving us access to an extraordinary range of testimonies. Olmsted's project began with the publication of his own description of the event in the New Haven newspaper which concluded, as he said, with a request for information from other observers. 
Olmsted's account was republished in other papers, creating a network of scientific gentlemen dashing off letters back to Yale. Now, combined with the reporting of other American newspapers, Olmsted created, as Mark Littman has argued, the first crowdsourced science, assembling a compilation of observations and then systematically analyzing them for common themes. As he did so, Olmsted encountered diverse abilities among these men of science. Offering what seemed to be calm and reasoned descriptions, these correspondents often let their speculations intrude upon their empiricism. Many linked the meteors to the weather, and they provided detailed accounts of temperature, precipitation, cloud cover, and wind pattern and velocity. Indeed, Olmsted's own prior work on hail may have led him naturally into what seemed a similar phenomenon. And he observed that it is hardly possible to persuade ourselves that two concurrent phenomena, both so remarkable as the change of the weather and the falling stars, were independent of each other, though it may prove a difficult point to decide the nature of this connection. Here's correlation mixing with causality. Caught between rigorous observation and speculative theorizing, the accounts reveal science in a developmental mode, somewhat unformed in method and open to those with a newspaper, a pen, and a stamp. Indeed, one of Olmsted's major uh, sort of informants was a guy who was basically just making it all up as he went along, and Olmsted had to sort of integrate this made up stuff into his data set. So many observers thought that the meteors were manifestations of electricity, one offering proof in the form of extra static generated when rubbing a silk handkerchief as he watched the stars fall. <laughs> Some theories tied this atmospheric uh, electricity to earthly elements, perhaps in the form of emendations and vapors rising into the sky and then igniting. This idea can be traced all the way back to Aristotle, who theorized four elemental forces, fire, air, earth, and water, that might come together, right, that rose up into the atmosphere and might come together as meteors, which was his term for anything that took place in the sky. Amazingly, in 1833, this Aristotelian system still had legs. Many believed that the stars were small objects close at hand rather than big objects far away. Uh, they may have been as close as four or five rifle shots up, as one person um, described it. So there's this sense that there was this dome and heaven was on the other side. So as astronomers are trying to think like this is actually far away, this creates a crisis, right, between the sort of different belief systems that are going on here. And the word meteor continued to have Aristotle's expansive meaning referring to a whole class of sky objects, dust and gravel, blood and other gelatinous substances, even the odd reports of grain and fish falling to the ground. Um, there are a lot of these kind of crazy reports. As one expert explained it, some philosophers are of the opinion that the wind has sufficient power to sweep from the surface of the earth large masses of various substances, lifting them to great heights in the atmosphere. And while there was some understanding of stony meteorites, observers only occasionally drew connections that would have linked them to the shooting stars. More likely, they thought, these rocks, these meteor stones, meteorites, were the products of lightning strikes. Here and there, a rock analyzed for its composition and found to be iron and nickel, as so many meteors are, would be described as being as preceded by a meteor of fire. Uh, but the general tendency of people of science at this moment was to make fun of anybody who thought that meteorites were the product of meteors, and in fact to sort of really emphasize this lightning theory, which then of course went into eclipse um, and became kind of a ridiculous theory, and then of course now we know lightning actually does interact right, with um, things. There's Mount Shasta um, with these fulgurites, these little block spotches. I mean, Mount Shasta gets a lot of lightning strikes and it actually transforms the nature of the rock. We've seen this with sand, you know, as well. So it's all, but it's all very very much up for grabs at this moment. In fact, the territory between geology, um, atmospheric science, and astronomy was tremendously murky. In the American Almanac of 1833, the heading Meteorology offered entries on red snow, mirages, various showers of dust and other material, and meteoric stones, which are described as earthy masses that fall from the sky. Their origin remains a mystery. Some suppose they are thrown from volcanoes in the moon uh, within the sphere of the Earth's attraction. In other words, an astronomical explanation. Others, that they exist completely formed in the atmosphere. In other words, an atmospheric or sky explanation. 
Uh, and finally, some consider them as fragments of matter which are thrown out of our own volcanoes to a great height and which fall after having described several revolutions. In other words, an earth science explanation. Right? So all of these things are mingled together right, in these sorts of explanations. In the first of two journal articles, Olmsted summarized what he thought he knew and he offered four possible causes. A change in the weather through the medium of electricity caused the meteors. The atmosphere had somehow descended, bringing the meteors with them. The meteors themselves caused the change in the weather or an unknown cause generated both the weather and the meteors. Olmsted's logic, of course, related, arrested upon a correlation that was assumed and that turned out to be incorrect. In a second article, though, just a few months later, as Olmsted thought about it and looked at his data a little more thoroughly, he delved more deeply, asking 11 key questions and laying out multiple hypotheses that pointed more directly to celestial causes. The meteors uh, originated in a distinct location, a radiant, as it's called, located in the constellation of Leo, thus the Leonids. And that radiant did not rotate with the Earth. It was, in other words, not an Earth-sky um, phenomenon, but an astronomical kind of one. And here is sort of where Olmsted comes down after thinking about it. And you can see the center of foundational moments in these hypotheses when we think about an astronomical kind of explanation. These meteors are originating from a very high place. They are traveling very quickly. They are encountering air and the friction is actually sort of generating, right, the lights that we're seeing when we see meteors. Um, and they originate from a kind of cloud of material that may be circling like a comet, right? So Olmsted is pretty much getting it right at this, uh, at this particular moment. So he used the falling stars to detach a modern theory of astronomical meteor science and then went on to write several textbooks almost immediately. Um, so he detached meteor science from uh, the more formal study of the atmosphere, what we now call meteorology, and that's why it's all very confusing. Um, but it's worth recalling that in those years, the status of science itself was not clear. Institutions were at that very moment struggling with one, and over, uh, one another over how to move forward with James Smithson's bequest, which was meant to animate American science, which of course eventually ended up not with a college, as some demanded at that moment, but with the federal science behind the Smithsonian Institute. And astronomy, in particular, Americans lamented, had really languished. Scandalously, the United States had only one observatory in 1833. And only two years later, Americans would fall for the Great Moon Hoax, a set of stories in the New York Sun extravagantly detailing life on the moon as discovered supposedly by a new kind of telescope. Equally important, as Rene Berglund has shown, science, particularly mathematical and observational fields such as astronomy, were more open to women than would be the case even a few decades later. Indeed, our familiar term scientist was coined to describe women engaged in sciences as opposed to the more common men of science terminology. Um, so this is Mariah Mitchell, uh, sort of America's great woman astronomer, taught at Vassar and raised up an entire crop of amazingly smart feminist women who right, traveled around doing astronomy. Really an amazing, amazing figure. So if science had, shall we say, a more open epistemological character, it was also true that the distinction Olmsted sought to draw between science and superstition sometimes failed him for his correspondence interpretations were not substantially better than those of the regular people, the ones he imagined to be consumed with astonishment and fear. And Olmsted's own language, mostly calm and dry, could at times take on the rapturous quality of those waiting for the rapture. And so, the Leonid meteors landed in a topsy-turvy topsy world. Science was fraught. Religious belief had been complicated by emotional revivals, demands for reform, new sects arriving everywhere, folk magic and predictions of the end times, conspiracy theories, of course. Nat Turner's rebellion, a fresh memory, Southerners turned uneasy as they watched the British formally end slavery in 1833 and heard the news of the founding of the New England Anti-Slavery Society. Only days before the Leonid showers, the Niles Register had reported on a ship, the Jupiter, carrying 50 colored immigrants back across the Atlantic to Liberia as part of the new colonization programs. The nullification crisis suggested that American politics was no more coherent than its science or its religion. To deal with it, Andrew Jackson had just signed the Force Bill, which increased his executive power. 
Newspapers proliferated column inches on the emerging problems of technology. 89 steam engines were operating in Pittsburgh, but 20 steam-powered paddle wheelers had been lost on American rivers over the previous four weeks. Does this sound like anything familiar? <laughs> oh, well, let's turn to economics. Everything was a calculation of price, amount, interest, and ratio, with freakouts about tariffs on wool, mismatched production of cotton, the failure of the old state economies of enslavement. The nation was only a few years away from the Panic of 1837. In what was then Mexico, tensions between the new nation state and the old Catholic Church led some to see the stars as a warning. As Josiah Gregg again observed, their church had been deprived of some important privileges by the Congress but a short time before, and the people could not be persuaded but that the meteoric shower was intended as a curse upon the nation in consequence of that sacrilegious act. That sacrilegious act was the 1833 decree for the secularization of the missions, which realigned land holding and freed Indian people in California, made them uh, open to new forms of exploitation. Back in the States, Indian removal marked a massive adjustment in American policy and the rapid displacement of native peoples from the eastern half of the continent. An earthquake shook the Salish Sea. The Black Hawk War and the Second Seminole War bracketed the meteor storm by only a year or two. Joseph Walker's expedition, as recounted by Zenis Leonard, was only a day or two from the Pacific Ocean when the stars fell, a harbinger of American settlement to come. Alexis de Tocqueville was crafting democracy in America, and Ralph Waldo Emerson was working through the ideas in his famous American Scholar Address, reminding Americans that it wasn't just politics, religion, slavery, Indian policy, economics, and science that were something of a mess. American literature and arts were in a bad way as well. Well, if we were to cast our eyes across the continent, looking on those November days, from New Haven to the Southland, from Ohio to the Dakotas to California, we might find ourselves drawn back to Fort Clark. There, a group of Mandan people convened to talk through the events of the night, to ponder together, and if possible, to draw their guests into the conversation. In short, to practice face-to-face something uh, very much like what Denison Olmsted was doing through a would-be national network of correspondence and reportage. And if the upper Missouri seems marginal relative to a place like Yale, well, it's worth remembering that the Mandans, who had their own science, their own thinkers, right, also had at their disposal James Kipp, an occasional man of science in the Olmstedian mode, and Maximilian, a rangy naturalist with some degree, or at least a future degree, of international credential. It might well have been a really good conversation. So the year the stars fell, asks us to shrink our usual understanding of history as a long, linear unfolding of time down to just a few hours. And having limited ourselves temporally, we are equally invited to expand our spatial vision to a near continental scope across a vast expanse, not at all yet fully national and so highly contested. A diverse range of people experienced the exact same event and responded in quite distinctive and different ways. And yet, within that diversity was also to be found human commonality. Everyone seemed to oscillate in some way or another between considering the meteors a physical event and a metaphysical sign, an occasion for inquiry and one for interpretation and perhaps prophecy. It is a timely history, I think, and instructive. For we are at a moment when the continental nation that is the present day United States looks as messy and complicated as it did in 1833. It reminds us, right, that as crazy it is now, right, times are always crazy, right? History is always crazy. We threaten to shatter into pieces over differences, political, scientific, religious, social, and cultural, that do in fact take epistemological shape. What is true? What is not true? What is real? What is unreal? How would we know? And what about all those other people who seem to have their own set of knowledges of which we might be suspicious? Well, I wonder if we might look to 1833 for a different vision, perhaps taking a cue from the Mandan leaders. That vision would be continental rather than nationalist. It would embrace both pluralism and commensurability. It would complicate science and religion, would seek redemption and blessed deliverance in tandem with the wondrous knowledge produced by marvelous space telescopes. It would be curious about the portent, 
taking seriously the possibility of disease and mass death among humans on our horizon. It would imagine shared experience while embracing the humility we should feel when we look to the heavens, whether we find shooting stars there or not. It could be indigenous, Afro-descendant, Mexican, Asian, and Emersonian, and Whitmanesque all at once. I mentioned Whitman because it's Whitman who actually records the story of Abraham Lincoln. Seeking to assure an audience of the stability of the Union, he turned to his memory of the Leonids. Like so many, he toyed with the idea that the stars were assigned, but that the end took them as something more of an event. I saw the stars falling in great showers, but looking back of them in the heavens, I saw all the grand old constellations with which I was so well acquainted, fixed and true in their places. Gentlemen, the world did not come to an end then, nor will the Union now. If Lincoln were here today, He'd no doubt implore us to do our best to see the fixed constellations and to make what sense of them we might. The story I've told is highly incomplete. I'm completely aware of that. But perhaps it offers just a glimmer of possibility. For some, we see the constellations as Orion and Sirius. For others, we focus on the North Star. For still others, Tayamanipa and the great native constellations. Same stars, different reading. Same stars, different reading. Same stars, different reading. Same stars. So I want to thank you for joining me today. Thank the School for Advanced Research for the opportunity to work through this project. I'm three weeks into my time here. As you might imagine, it doesn't invite the usual structure of historical projects, beginning, uh, middle, end, change over time. So I am very much looking forward over the next months to figuring it out as best I can in tandem with my wonderful colleagues in this most wonderful of setting and perhaps in the company of some of you as well. Thank you all so much. And I believe we now take some questions. And here's the first one. Yes, I wanted to know, uh, what was the impetus for, for this study that you're making? What, what got you there? So when I was, I've had this project, I've been dragging this project around for my entire career. And I'm, and I'm thinking about retiring. <laughs> so when I was a grad student, um, I worked for George Miles, the curator of Western Americana, uh, Americana at the Beinecke Library at Yale. And he would give me wonderful sort of tasks. Here's a box full of uncategorized, uncatalogued uh, Overland Trail diaries. You go through it. Um, he would let me disappear every Thursday afternoon and sort of wander through the archives and look at interesting things. George and I got very, very interested in winter counts. We did an independent study together, sort of looking at all the different winter count literature and thinking a lot about time and temporality and history in relation to the winter count. So that's actually the way that, um, that I entered the project, thinking, and that's why there's such a large section of it, which is focused on the Northern Plains. Um, but for me, the winter counts really raised these questions about sort of, um, the ways that native ways of thinking and doing and being are oftentimes boxed in unsuccessfully into the categories of science and religion. And many, many, many native traditions, in fact, completely destroy and dissolve those categories, right? Things which are framed by ethnographers as sacred knowledge oftentimes also have an observational kind of component to it. And, you know, and for me, this has become even more urgent, you know, as sort of native knowledge has become part of a broader kind of conversation, right? When we think about Robin Wall Kimmerer sort of taking science and uh, native knowledge and bringing those things together. Um, it also, I would say, comes to me through my, my dad, Vine Deloria Jr.'s own real strong interest in the ways that native traditions and science actually might sit together in, a, in an uneasy tension that had not been fully realized, really. So some part of it is trying to think through some of those things. A bit, and then of course, once you realized it became, once I realized it became continental, and I had friends start sending me things, you know, and so, and then over the years, I've had, you know, four or five really talented um, research assistants, um, and I've just sort of, I've been working on other stuff, and I've said, look, 
If you've got an extra 15 hours over the next couple weeks, right, and you're working for me, go do a, you know, library search on this stuff. And so what's been really interesting is actually to see the ways in which sort of, for example, our search tools as historians have changed over time. You know, the first person who worked on this was Constance Clark, who now teaches at Worcester Polytechnic, um, fabulous history of science grad student who went through all the old newspapers using the Reader's Guide to Periodical Literature, right? And now, you know, we just go online and we put in 1833 stars and, you know, all of a sudden we have this proliferation of, of material. So I've accumulated a lot of material over the years and just over the last four or five years have tried to actually sort of systematize it in a way to kind of help me think through what it would look like as a project. That probably is too much about my own process, but that's how it, that's how it played out. Yeah. I've got a question. Uh, thank you for this Sorry. lovely, uh, pr uh, rich presentation. I wondered, uh, in this uh, uh, wonderful attempt to uh, get really the science, if you will, and uh, the mythological, the fabulous together, have you thought about the uh, earlier phenomenon uh, that continues, I think, into the 19th century of wonder, uh, the phenomenon of wonder, uh, which I think crosses over uh, the concept of rapture um, and the various sciences. And, and um, I think one of your broadsides said remarkable phenomena, uh, particularly associated with remarkable uh, phenomena. So just wondering about that from, you know, cabinets of curiosity right. containing um, uh, meteorological phenomena to uh, lapid any kind of lapidary phenomena, but things that in some way are uncanny or strange. So just wondering if you looked and thought about wonder as maybe uh, the connective tissue, um, historically speaking. Yeah, it's a great question, and thank you for it. And it's, it's funny, you know, I had a fabulous graduate student, Jennifer Creedon, who actually wrote an entire dissertation on wonder. I should have been thinking more about this. But you're right. I mean, in some ways, it's, it's both the connective tissue, right, that pulls together these disparate kinds of ways of thinking and seeing and experiencing. But it's also a kind of category of its own, right, at least one that is visible to us in retrospect as a category, you know, of its own that is not quite the same thing as this scientistic kind of way. I mean, it's, it's overlapping with that. In some ways, I mean, you know, reading through the journals of Maximilian is, is perhaps a, one way for me to think more about sort of engaging that because he's a guy who's actually sort of cataloging in a Linnaean kind of way and collecting and all of those kinds of things, but also open to a sense of, there is a sense of wonder I think that one sees, you know, in that kind of, in his writing and I think other kinds of writing as well. What I'm going to simply say is like, I'm, I've written this down. Um, thanks Miriam for making me take a pen. Um, uh, and I'm and I'm going to want to think more about it. Yeah, thank you. So it's a, it's a sort of a stereotype that indigenous people are likely to think in terms of cycles and circles, and Western historians and scientists are supposed to think linearly. But I don't see that in the story that you told. So what's what's does this give the lie to that stereotype? Well, yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, one of the things that. George Miles and I thought a lot about is, you know, a lot of these winter counts are in spiral forms. And at that time, people were saying, oh, the spiral is because native people think in cyclical terms. I'm like, the spiral is not a, a circle. The spiral is a linear thing that is arranged, right? I mean, it's, so it's not exactly that. It's something that allows you to claim a linearity, you know, out of it. I, I think these things are way oversimplified. I mean, I think, you know, to, to say these things in some ways is to always, always already position Native people in a kind of primitivist, romantic fantasy, right, of people who, like, don't see time and kind of only see space and, and you know, but I, that's just not, and what that denies Native folks is a history of rational engagement and encounter and serious empirical, uh, you know, living and investigation with their worlds. And these are people who know their worlds really, really, really well. You know, and how do they get to know them? They, they get to know them through spiritual kinds of practices which are completely and totally integrated and linked, right, with thought and reason and all kinds of engagement, right? I mean, so, you know, when it's winter time and it's time to tell stories, I mean, these stories are not just sort of, oh, isn't this a kind of cute mythological story, right? These stories are the occasion, right, for deep philosophical kinds of exchanges and thoughts. So it's always felt to me really important to, to sort of reclaim, right, um, sort of linearity in addition to 
right, this sort of sense of time as a super complicated thing. Perhaps it's got cyclical dimensions. Perhaps, right, it's got spatialized, yes, yes to all of those kinds of things. But I, I think it's, it's robbing Native people of a quintessentially human kind of practice, right, of investigating. And, and it also it allows us to, to lay scientific method back as a Western thing, but that's just not true, right? We think if you digest what that is, if you abstract it, it's like, I pay attention to what's going on in my world, right? Well, how often do we see that in Native stuff? Black elk, pay attention, right? Always pay attention. We pay attention to our world. We observe what we see. Right? Uh, we remember that. We form kinds of theories or ideas about it. We test those ideas. Th this is the story of Native people in their encounter with their worlds, right? right? We pass on that knowledge to other people. We accumulate it over time, right? So why defer that kind of practice only to the West when, in fact, Native people have been doing that always? So yes, it's, I, I'm quite polemical on this, right? I mean, I totally, totally think that like these things are misframed, you know, for us in, in ways that dehumanize Native folks, and 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 they're, they're not right. This is not right. I don't mean to have my voice get all raised. I don't, to, don't mean to raise my voice at you on this. I'm, I'm just curious that all of this is very America centric. And it would seem to me if, if the Earth is passing through this huge meteor shower, they would have seen them in China and in you know Europe and in Africa. And are are there not stories and legends and history of their reaction? Um, for this particular one, it's pretty North America kind of centric, right? So it's not it's not the case that everybody on the planet gets to see the meteors every time that they they appear. So in 902, which is really the first observation of this, this is Middle Eastern kinds of observations. There's Chinese, as you would quite rightly expect, uh, observations from Chinese astronomers that go, that, that are part, a deep part of the record there. Um, but not every shower is visible in every particular kind of place. Yeah. It is really interesting. And it's one of the things that, that after Dennis and Olmsted, a guy whose name is Newton, but it's not Isaac Newton, it's, and it's not Huey Newton either. It's, 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 I, I'm, I'm, blanking, I'm blanking on his first name. In any case, in the, in the 1860s, he's actually um, theorizing co the comet theory, and he's figuring these things out. And one of the things that he does is he goes back in the historical record. He's really the first astronomer to dive deep into the historical record and to say, like, oh my gosh, it happens here, it happens here, it happens here, it happens here. The 33-year cycle right, comes out of that, sort of between Dennis and Olmsted and Newton. They figure this out, and then there's a prediction, like, well, if it's a 33-year cycle, we, and we saw one in 1799, Olmsted actually also sees this, that um, Humboldt in South America sees the meteors in 1799. They start collecting, well, who also saw it in 1799? This guy, Andrew Ellicott, who's a sort of interesting naturalist who's on a ship in the Caribbean, he sees it. Some folks in the Atlantic actually see 1799 and 33. So all of a sudden, Newton and others are starting to collect historical data that allows them to say, in 66, there will be another meteor shower. And then there is, and yay, science has worked, right? We have made a prediction, right? A theoretical thing. And one of the things about theory is it predicts as well as describes. It predicts, and in fact, the prediction is successful. Then what, I mean, this is an interesting little sidebar. Then what happens is they're like, well, in 1899, it's in 1899 is a complete bust. And so there's astronomers who say, like, this was the most damaging thing that ever happened to American astronomy, <laughs> was that the meteors didn't show up in 1799. And then it's also the case, if you remember that little chart, you, there's a, it kind of goes like this, and then there's a series like this, and then it kind of tails off, right? So the Leonids won't last forever, right? They're going to disappear. We won't see them, you know, anymore. And you couldn't really see them before the 8th century. So we're in this kind of historical, you know, kind of moment. So people in the, in the 20th century were actually thinking, oh, you know, we're pretty much done with them. And then 18, uh, 1966 appears. Kaboom, it's this amazing meteor shower. But what's really interesting to me is the 33 shower left behind a ton of records. I'm certainly not the first person to sort of think about this. Mark Lippman, who I mentioned before, has written a quite wonderful and fun book about, about these as a sort of historian and kind of writer on astronomy. Um, 
you know, but 60, how many people remember the Leonids of 66? I was alive, I don't remember them at all. I, you know, so there's these moments where things come and go into our historical memory, which is also a bit of a, a part of it. Why 33 so powerful? I think it has something to do with that particular moment of science. And by 66, astronomers are figuring this stuff out. They're very excited. Um, but the rest of us, I don't know. I, maybe I just missed it. But. Thanks for this. Um, I was struck by the really wonderful poetic way that you closed and this question of, I think, what really felt, felt really brilliant and powerful about this to me was the matching of medium and method always, or medium and message, right? And so I guess my question is really this description of a continental but not national, physical, metaphysical, diverse, universal, you know, the, this kind of amazing analytical work that you're doing, you ended attributing to a Mandan view of 1833, the year the stars fell. And so I wondered how much of that's the view from the ground you know, that's with the Mandan character you're starting with, how much of that's the kind of analytical work you've been developing along the way, and how, if you might talk a little bit about the development of those two perspectives. Um, Ali, so great to see you. <laughs> um, well, Dave and I were chatting about this beforehand, and I said there's two soft spots in this talk. And, and I think, you know, <clears throat> one of them is, why aren't you saying more about the Southwest given that we're sitting in Santa Fe? And the answer to that is the research sort of, you know, trajectory actually has not led there. And one of the things that's very exciting for me about being here is to actually sort of, you know, engage that um, question. The other is this thing that you point to is, is my sort of gesture to the present moment, right? Which in some ways, you know, I, I see as being more rhetorical than analytical. Um, you know, it's a, it's a rhetorical gesture that says history matters, and this particular history matters, and you might not think that 1833 matters, and you might not care about astronomy or meteors or anything like that in the light of our present crisis, but in fact, it's a rhetoric that says, please will you pay attention to this history and think through it, you know, think about it, um, as opposed to a kind of analytical, you know, kind of, um, you know, kind of claim. Um, about its, you know, it's a rhetorical claim to significance as much as an analytical claim. I mean, I think there's a different set of analytical claims to significance, right, you know, for this that have to do with, um, you know, they, they overlap in some ways with the rhetoric, right, that have to do with the sort of diversity of things, with the unfinishedness. I mean, for me, the United States in the 1830s is a, prof it, I said, profoundly weird place. The whole continent is a profoundly weird place. Everything that's happening is weird, you know. And and for me, it's always had the, it's always had the affect of, um, okay, this is going to seem very strange, I, I suspect, but there's there's a there's a vignette in in Huckleberry Finn, when Huck and Jim are floating down the river. And, you know, and they get to an island and a house comes floating by and they go in the house and they're like, oh my God, there's a dead man here and there's a dark lantern and there's greasy cards everywhere and there's some clothing and it's like, I don't know about you, but the affect of that to me is so weird, right? And it's like, that is 1830s America, right? <laughs> it's just a weird place, it's a violent place, it's a creepy place, it's an unfinished place, it's full of all of this sort of oddness to it. And you know, so some part of what I wanna do is to try to capture, you know, capture that. Um, uh, and to, I, I think, sort of de-essentialize our sense that, like, of course, science has been going since the Enlightenment and the Renaissance and all that stuff. It's not true, right? Science is a mess in this particular moment. And the fact that people in the 1830s are still believing in Aristotelian kind of figurations of the Earth, that to me is mind blowing. So, it's, so all of these things, I think, like, do actually kind of point us um, well, maybe, maybe I'm coming around to analytical, you know, as well, right? Because there's still people out there in the world who believe that there is a dome across the planet, right, and that we've never actually penetrated the atmosphere, that no one ever went to the moon, et cetera, et cetera, right? So the beliefs of the 1830s are still actually, you know, in many cases still functional, you know, today. So that was, sorry, that was a kind of a thought in process kind of train, but I, I'm hoping it gets to, gets to where you're at, Ali. Thank you for such a wonderful presentation. I mean, one, the way you presented it, one could think, well, this was a, a sort of a natural laboratory in the 1830s. You had all of these isolated 
uh, populations uh, separated from one another, just coming together with their own sort of um, encapsulated uh, epistemologies and ways of knowledge. Um, so bring it up to the present day, uh, we're uh, kind of building on your last remarks, we're still uh, sort of occupy these separate knowledge universes, mm -hmm. uh, encapsulated and isolated, despite mass communications and the internet. So, is this something about human nature that you're talking about, or <laughs> sociology, or what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, part of my argument really is is both, and, and it's part of the challenge of thinking about how this actually takes shape on the page. Right. Is the better strategy to say, like, this is a messed up world of diverse kinds of things, and I'm going to walk you through each one and show you how different they are, and then I'm going to come back around and say, like, you know what? Guess what? There's a kind of humanist argument I want to make about the commensurability of these responses and the similarity of them. In other words, do a kind of big comparative thing where it's like difference, 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 similarity. Right? I mean, that might be one strategy, and it's a strategy that I think would sort of, you know, ask us to make that as a spatial kind of thing across the continent, but also would imply a kind of temporality to it, right? If the claim is that it's a humanist thing that is perhaps, well, being figured historically also has trans-historical kinds of dimensions to it, right? I mean, so that might be one kind of strategy and one way of thinking about like saying, this is why it's relevant to the present moment because all the stuff that we're seeing then, we're still seeing now. All the responses of human beings back then are the same responses we're seeing now. I mean. You know, as a historian, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to um, go too far down that road, um, just because particularity, locality, the specifics of temporality are also really quite important to me. But it is also true, I'm an American studies person, and we have a kind of a license to go big if we want to. So, um, yeah. yeah, so I may, I may do something like that. I'm sure people would be happy to answer questions if you want to stay behind for a while, but join me in thanking him again. Mm -hmm.